Hey everyone, welcome to Home Cooking with Foodland. We're really excited to have everyone here today. I hope you guys had fun uh, over the last week recreating your versions of uh, the Chinese chicken salad that we did and the pork with bitter melon and black beans. We got some pictures from every, some, a few people that uh, were happy enough to share their dishes and we're really excited about that. They looked awesome. Um, we're really happy and excited about today's class. Um, and as you can see, we're outside and I'm, I wanted to prove to everyone that we're actually shooting this in Hawaii on Oahu. And there you go. There's the, the Koala mountain range we have there for you folks. So if you are watching from somewhere other than Hawaii or maybe a neighbor island, um, you get to see a little bit of paradise and it is, it is beautiful out here. And so we're trying to, you know, while we are dealing with a pandemic, it's always nice to be in a place where uh, you can, you can kind of like hunker down and it's, 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 it's not a bad place to, to have to hunker down. Um, we're doing steak today. We're doing a cucumber salad. I think it's gonna be really cool to do. Um, and this is all sort of ideas that you can use for a Labor Day. And we are gonna finish it off with a nice, uh, a nice cocktail or a sangria, which I think is very, very delicious. Um, again, a couple of things. I really enjoy the questions. Um, it helps me feel like we're having a conversation. So please don't hesitate to send us your questions using the Q&A function. On, on the Zoom app and uh, we'll get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is uh, we'll do the steak and I have my grill here. I'm heating it up on high. So it's gonna be, right now it looks like it's about 600 degrees um, and we're gonna go ahead and um, start getting this going. Now, the recipe that I sent on with the ingredients has um, sort of salt and pepper and you can season it as you do it. But I thought it'd be fun also to show you folks how to make like a seasoning salt and um, it's easy, easy to do. You can make this in batches. They're great gifts for giving, um, but also something that you can use as an all-purpose thing to cook with. And so I have some alae salt, and this is sea salt that has alae dirt or soil added to it, and that's what makes it red. And that red clay soil that's added to it gives it more flavor. It gives it an earthy sort of a terroir flavor, which is really adds to the character. There's lots of minerals in there. So I'm gonna put some in here to get this started. And then I'm also gonna to start to season this. This, when I'm done with this, will look like some of the seasonings that you see in our stores. Um, and again, you can make your own custom blend and become known for your own version. So I'm adding fresh cracked pepper. And then I'm gonna add some garlic powder. And I'm gonna add some onion powder and one of, you know I was looking at ingredient lists of the different brands that are out there and one of the things that I see in a lot of them that you might not think about is right here ground ginger I'm gonna add a little bit of that and I, you know what's cool about that to me is like it seems it feels very like local Hawaii because of the Asian influence that we have so then I'm just gonna quickly toss it together And when you look at it, see, look at that. Doesn't this look like some of the seasonings that you might find on the shelf? And then you made your own custom one. Make it in little containers and then you're good to go. So today we're gonna be using a flank. Uh, and again, if you have a different steak you like, that's great. But I thought it'd be fun to use flank because flank is a little bit of, it's a leaner, a leaner cut of beef. And, um, it requires a different kind of an approach versus let's say a ribeye or a New York strip that has a lot of fat in it, which, which helps with the tenderizing and keeping it moist if you cook it more than medium rare. Uh, this, is a, this is a cut of beef that again is lean. As you can see, it's very red and there's not a lot of fat and marbling in this piece here, see? So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be focusing on cooking this more to a medium or medium goodness because that way I can keep the moisture in here and keep it from becoming really, really dry. So we have our steaks. I'm gonna take some of our seasoning and just season it so that you can see, you can see the dry herbs on there and you can see the, the spacing that we have of the Hawaiian salt. That's kind of what you're looking for. I'm gonna turn it over to the other side. And when I'm doing a steak at home, I'll usually do it in the tray like this so that I can get the thing seasoned and then I can get rid of the tray. And that's one less dish that Sharon has to wash. 
I get points for that. Okay, so we'll do that. And then I'm gonna just put a little bit of oil on here because it will help with, uh, you know, when I'm grilling, it doesn't stick on the grill. And I, in this case, I'm using a little bit of our my Cutty Extra Virgin Olive Oil. While I'm gonna grill it, I do think that the Extra Virgin Olive Oil will give it just a little bit of a, just a very minor, a little bit of additional flavoring. But if you have uh, regular olive oil, that works great. If you have vegetable oil, that also works great. The focus here is you're putting something on here to kind of help with the, it helps just almost a, a quick marination with the salt and all the spices. And then it also helps prevent the sticking on the grill when you're gonna grill it. I'm gonna, this is not in the recipe, but I'm gonna do something here to show you also what you can do as we think about flavor and layering, right? I have a piece of lemon. I'm gonna squeeze a little bit on here. And this also helps with a little bit of that flavor development. Now, if you're gonna do the lemon like I did, you'll notice that the steak will start to turn a little bit of lightly grayish because that's the acid that's kind of chemically cooking the beef, right? But that's fine because you're gonna grill it, but you're gonna get a nice little dimension of citrus um, character in the steak of just another subtle note, which I think can really add to the dish here, okay? Now, you can put this like, you can do this and you can let it sit. I usually let it sit, but depending on time, right? Like I'm a total procrastinator or I'm very spontaneous. I'd be like, hey guys, let's get over. Let's have a get together while we'll the dinner. I might not be able to marinate it, which is fine. So you're just gonna go ahead straight on the grill. So marinating, it's good, but don't feel bad if you're not able to and you gotta go straight on the grill. Would and it's really quiet out there. Oh, oh no, no, a lot of questions. Would you okay. ever have to pound the meat with a tenderizer or, or uh, a hammer to tenderize it? You could if you want to, but if you if you follow what I'm going to show you on how to cook it, you don't have to. Okay. So we're going to uh, put it on the grill. And one of the things I want to show you. So, so the grill. Well, okay. Here's the grill. It's going. The grates are going this way. I'm gonna put the steak on the grill at a 45 degree angle, okay? And by the way, I've heated this grill up and I pre-scraped it with my grill brush to clean off any debris that was on there. And can you add the oil to any cut of meat that you barbecue? You, you absolutely can. Um, and um, like for me, it's, it's a good, um, kind of a marination technique. Like one thing that I used to do a lot of when we were in restaurants is I would take, we would do like know, 300 10 ounce fillets and I would put smashed garlic, thyme, sometimes rosemary, a little bit of olive oil and just kind of let it all sit together. And that would kind of help pre-season the steak and get it ready for grilling. So yes, you can absolutely do that. And it, I think it really, it enhances the dish. Um, again, if you don't have it, so that's the tricky thing. That's the fun thing about cooking is if you don't have it, don't let that stop you. I've done it without the oil, but I also, this is, the, this is another way that I do it and I tend to do it and I get really good results with it, okay? Now, I put the grill, I put the steak on the grill. I close the cover because I want to try to maintain the heat. And this steak is about an inch, an inch plus or minus thickness. And so what I'm looking for is about two minutes, two minutes, flip it over two minutes, two minutes, and I should be in good shape. I like a medium or a medium, and then we're going to let it rest. Okay, so we'll let it do its thing. And I'm going to try using my spidey senses to keep track of the time. Did you also use this seasoning on prime rib and put the oil on prime rib too? If you're gonna do a prime rib, I you could. And what I would do if I was gonna do a prime, well, there's a couple ways you can do a prime rib, right? Like in restaurants, what I would do is I get a big, a big tray and then I bury the prime rib in salt. Okay, so for those of you that are from Hawaii or Oahu, who maybe went to Horatio's, which then became Kincaid's or Ryan's Grill. Um, you, they were pretty well known. One of the things they did really well was prime rib, right? And so what we would do there is we would put in a big bar tray and pour it with salt, big like ice cream machine salt, ice cream grinder salt, and we would bake it fully in the salt, which really helped season it. Um, if you're gonna do it at home, a prime rib, I would take the rib. You could rub it with oil, which helps because it also helps if I would then rub it with salt and, and cracked pepper, which kind of crusts it, helps it stick, and then I would go ahead and roast it. 
I think I was. I feel like I was talking for two minutes. Sorry. Let's oh, see what we got here. We it's have a fire. fire. I'm gonna turn it. You see yeah, that? By the way, that's the that's the that's, 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 that's what it looks like if you don't clean your grill. grill. We'll see what happens. Keone is flank and skirt steak the same thing. That's a good question. Flank, I gotta check. I can I'll check and you know we'll get back to you on this, but flank has been referred to as a skirt steak, but in my head there is also something called a skirt steak, which is not flank. It's a different cut. The flank, I will tell you just so we're on so technically the flank is one of the abdominal muscles off of the calf. Or the or the cattle that you're gonna that you eat or the beef that you're eating. So, um, it depends on the terminology that's used out there. So I will say that it could be depending on who you're talking to. I'm gonna try to put this fire out, okay? And it never fails. And I decide we're gonna cook outside. Something happens. I guess this is like real life. Uh, if, you know? you, if someone doesn't have an outdoor grill, what kind of pan would you recommend for? Uh, uh, if, you're, if you have a grill pan, one of those cast iron pans with, with little grates you can try it. It's called, people call it a French grill. And it's interesting. I'm not even cooking. We're just going to talk story, which is cool with me too. Um, but when I was cooking in French restaurants, they had these things that are like cast iron with the grates and they call them a French grill because from what I understood is, well, the French didn't really buy into the whole grilling thing because that's a very american thing it's very like aggressive it's very smoky it's very charring and french cuisine is very light and it's very delicate and so that that was like they weren't having that so a french grill was used to like put like marks on it so to emulate the grilling technique but it didn't have all the same smoke and craziness that those american guys like um but uh you could use long story short you could use a french grill or a, a grill with grates or you could sear it in a pan. Just sear it like you know, in a saute pan with some oil, and you'll get you'll get a good result. It'll be a different result, but it'll still be good. And so, by the way, when I turn the, I started the steak this way, then I turn it that way, and then I'm turning it again so that I'm facing this way, and then I'm going to turn it that way. And when I'm in a restaurant and I'm doing, I have like 20 steaks at a time. I can tell what what's what status of a steak is by which direction, how many marks it has and in which direction it's pointing. And that's kind of like one of those coding systems that we used to use in the restaurant. So we'll let our steak keep going and we're gonna move on to our salad. I have cucumbers and I washed them already, but I put them back in the bag because I wanted you to see these. These are local um, cucumbers. They call them keiki cukes from Hawaii farming. And what, it's from the Big Island, by the way. And what I like about them is they're great for the salad we're gonna do because the um the seeds are really small and so i don't have to scrape them out you know if you've been with us for a couple of different series you've seen that i will scrape out the center of the cucumber japanese cucumber because it's like really pulpy and the seeds are big this these are very it's, very, it's small and you'll see when i cut into them how um how how nice they are but i'm going to cut the ends off of them real quick And then we're gonna go ahead and bruise them. And what we're this is a technique that I'm seeing we were seeing a lot these days, and it's kind of fun. And it's I think the idea is that it's it's a rustic cooking technique. This one is the thinner steak, by the way. These two are are thicker. This one's gonna be done sooner. Okay. And I'm feeling the center of the, the thickest part of the steak because I'm looking for that how it pushes back and it's very it's kind of it doesn't push back quite yet so it's this one is definitely rare rare this is more rare moving into medium rare okay um but this interest this cool thing that they're doing now is this called the bruise technique and really what you're doing is you're kind of smashing it and it by bruising it and breaking up the cell structure when you mix it together it allows the flavors to go in better and it's a very rustic technique and i think What's fun about cooking these days is at one time, professional cooking was very much about precision. And you, now you're seeing there's a more relaxed approach to cooking and it's okay to have a more 
rough edge appeal to that as long as the food is really delicious and so that's kind of what we're focusing on here so what i'm going to just do is take my chinese cleaver or whatever you have and just smash it like that and then i'm going to cut it down the center see how it's squashed i'm going to just kind of chop it up and you see how small these seeds are smash people are like oh my god this is a perfect cooking technique to teach your kids like, hey, you make the salad tonight. So can I tell you about blank versus skirt steak? Please do. We're going to do a fact, fact, we're doing a fact, fact check right now. <laughs> so the blank steak comes from the abdominal area, like you said. And the skirt steak is actually the diaphragm of the steer. There you go. And People usually use skirt steak for fajitas because it can, it has a different grain structure and it can soak up the marinade better than a flank steak. And you should not confuse flank steak with flat iron steak. Yes, yes flat, flat iron steak is a whole other thing. thing. Yes. It comes from, it's a flat iron. Um, the interesting thing about skirt steak to Cheryl's point is, um, Typically, a skirt steak uh, is it's not it's 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 one of those cuts of meat that was considered like we would call them humble cuts, which means that they weren't like, you know, they're not your your. Uh, I'm looking for 120, by the way. I'm there. Um, it's not the kind of cut of meat that like it's not a ribeye. It's not your premium cuts, and they used to be very inexpensive, very inexpensive, and then people caught note of that that it was very inexpensive. And they all started buying it. See, 110. See, this is the thickest one, 110. We're going to go just a little bit lower, a little bit more. And as you can see, I'm putting it on this pan because I want to let it rest. Um, but there were humble cuts of meat. And then they were so humble that everyone said, I'm going to buy those because they're inexpensive. And guess what happened? They became really expensive and hard to find now. Is but typically, there something specific you look for when choosing the right flank steak cut? Uh, Hang on for a second. When I'm looking for a flank steak, I'm looking for, and I should have said that before, sorry, but we cooked all the steaks already. What I'm looking for is that the butcher and the store really clean them up. So when you look at, when you, if you think back what I, what I grilled in here, it wasn't a whole lot of like fat or sinew on top of that flank. It was very clean. So you want to see a really evenly clean piece without a lot of membrane on there. That's the key that you're looking for. Um, on a nice piece of flank. And for what I'm looking for, like what I was trying to do when I chose the steaks that I was going to do, I was looking for uniformity and thickness because I ideally want to try to have all my steaks cook at the same time. Now, a flank typically is going to be, if you had a whole flank, one side's thin and then it gets wider like that and then it comes down. And then our butchers, because a whole flank might be too much for people to buy when you weigh it, they cut them down. So either if you like if you like more cooked, like more well, pick the thinner pieces. But if you like more medium rare, rare, pick the fatter pieces because that way the fatter pieces when you're grilling them have more time to caramelize to brown on the outside before they cook through on the inside. <coughs> and then I'm gonna pull this off and we'll let that thing we'll let it rest. So we have our steaks. They're they're gonna nicely rest here while we're finishing our salad. Did you use this same flank <clears throat> steak to make beef tomato? Or what, what would you use for beef tomato? For beef tomato, I would use chuck. Um, chuck's a great cut of meat. It's a great value. It's a great price point. Um, and it lends itself well to the longer cooking time that's needed to make beef tomato. For beef tomato, you're, it's more of a, it's a slow cook. It's a moist, mes moist method. So it's like more of a braise or a stew. <clears throat> so I would use something like that. That said, if you've been with us on all the other cooking that we did, like the Chinese stir fry stuff, what I would do if I was gonna do a beef tomato, I would approach it like a Chinese dish, which is where it originated from. And I would I would do the process of velveting, right? Which was where we put um, the cornstarch, egg whites, and or the baking soda, the alkaline to help with the, the protein structures in there to keep them from being dry when you eat it. Okay, moving into the cucumber salad, I got our smashed, cucumbers, right? I'm going to put a little bit of sugar. What I'm trying to do is 
replicate almost a goma, a goma dressing. So just a very light, a light dusting of sugar that we're gonna go on top of there. We're gonna put a little bit of salt and we'll put some cracked pepper. Notice what I'm seasoning, by the way. I like this layer that I have and when I'm seasoning, I'm looking for a very even light coating across. That's how it tells me that I'm evenly seasoning. Watch when I put the pepper, you'll see the contrast, right? You see how I'm coating this very evenly? That's what I'm looking for, okay? A very even dusting on the top when I'm doing this. Now we're going to add a little bit of, um, well, I have rice wine vinegar, which is in my closet, in my cabinet, in the kitchen. But basically what I need is acid. So I'm going to add a little bit of lemon juice for acid. If you have your rice wine vinegar, go for it. Put that in there. But that's what I'm gonna do for my acid. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of uh, sesame oil. Just a dash. We're gonna add some sesame seeds. I'm sorry, we're gonna add some mayonnaise to make it creamy. If you don't like it creamy, you don't have to add them either, but I'm gonna add a little bit because, and the mayonnaise is just so excited that it wants to jump out. We'll add a little bit of sesame seeds. One thing could be interesting, if you, if you don't wanna do mayonnaise, you could do sour cream, you could do yogurt. Greek yogurt would be really interesting in there. So there are other alternatives that you can use, uh, but I wanna stir this all up. I'm looking for just a light, light, nice light coating. I'll put just a little bit more mayo in here. And if someone doesn't want to smash the cucumbers like you did this because it's so messy, can they put it in a food processor? I would, I would not, not put it in a food processor, processor because you're going to end up with pureed cucumbers. So what I would do is just slice them or dice them. Couldn't you put it in the food processor and just pulse it? You could, but then what you're going to have to do is to, to, to do that, you're going to take the cucumber then cut it into like smaller pieces to put it in the processor to pulse it. And, and you could do that, but it's, I'm, you're going to, you're adding steps to the process. And so if I was going to, if I was going to do this, then I would just dice them because then I wouldn't have to pull my food processor out and I wouldn't have to clean it. But if you want to, you can. So if you don't have a meat thermometer, yes. how can you check for doneness? And do you always use a meat thermometer even when we're not here and you're cooking alone? When I'm cooking alone, that sounds like, sounds sad. But yes, when I'm, when I'm not with all of you um, and I'm cooking, I do still use a thermometer. And the reason why I do is because I'm not in a kitchen every day. When I was working in a restaurant and doing I was 500 dinners a day and I was cooking 100 steaks, I did not need a thermometer because I could nail it. But because I don't do them every day, I tend to use a thermometer just to make sure because I'm rusty. But um, what I would say is, here, look, here, look, come here, come here. Um, Chastity, our camera person. So if I push on this steak, right, this one, the thinner one, you see how it's pushing back? You can kind of see the elasticity, right? This one is medium or medium. This one here, you see how it feels like more fleshy? It looks like it's fleshy. And so this is a little bit less done than this one. And this one, actually, it might be a little bit less done than this one because it's super relaxed. But the point I'm making is, if you want to test, right, what I'm seeing here, if I push over here, I get the similar resistance. By pushing here, I'm getting more like here. So you can use the flesh, the palm of your hand extended, and where it's really soft here, in between your, your index finger and your thumb, is rare. As you move further up here, when it gets firmer, this is where it starts to move more done. So rare, medium rare, medium, medium well, and where it's really firm is well done. That's how you can, you can do, you can test without using a thermometer. Keep in mind that this steak is going to cook 10 degrees more after you pull it off because of carryover cooking. So on the grill, I would pull it off a little bit under, softer, more relaxed than what I wanted to actually end up at. That's what, what you can do to test. The other thing you can do to test what they do in, in, in the classical old school cooking is they would have like a little, if you think of a skewer, a metal skewer, they would, they would push it into the steak, pull it out and touch it to the bottom of your lip underneath here because that's very sensitive, right? And so 
your body is 98.6 degrees unless you have a fever, at which point you should probably go get uh, a COVID test. Um, but assuming you're, you're at normal temperature, you're at 96. And so anything above that feels hot to you, right? So that's how you can tell relative temperature. It's not a perfect science, but you can kind of, you can gauge it that way, okay? And should you uh, tent your meat while it rests? Sorry? Should you tent your meat with aluminum foil? You while can. It's I mean, part of the tenting process is to try to keep some of the, the heat in so that it stays warm before you're going to serve it. So you can. I, I don't typically when I'm cooking at home on a steak like this. By the time it's rested, everything's ready to go, and I'm like ready to dive in. But if like you know, if you're going to have a roast or something, that's when you tent it to try to keep help keep it warm before you're going to serve it. Okay, so we're going to put some green onions in here. And I've, I don't even, I don't have my clock or my watch, which I normally do. So I'm going to ask uh, Cheryl, how are we doing on time? Okay, I'm good. So we're going to cut some green onions. I'm throw them in here. By the way, you know, the, the whoever was asking about whether if you don't want to bruise it, you should totally try it bruised because the texture is completely different. The texture on the edges of the cucumber becomes softer because it's bruised, it's lightly smashed. And then, you know, if you're having a get together, right? And you can tell, you can tell people, well, I'm serving smashed cucumbers. They're like, what? It just sounds cool. So it's a whole cool conversation piece, you know? Do you have a recommendation for a thermometer or what to look for when buying a meat thermometer? Yeah, I, I guess you do. So let me, uh, before I give you the, re well, the recommendation that I have for meat thermometers, if you're asking for a specific brand, I would say Taylor, and you can get those in all the kitchen supply stores. And this one is, I'm gonna cover this. This is a kitchen well, the kitchen equipment company that I got it from is Bar Green Alex, and that's a professional company. By the way, if you're on Oahu, you can go buy stuff from there. But see, it's just Taylor underneath here, right? And Taylor is a very well respected company for thermometers, scales and thermometers. So uh, a dial thermometer is great. Uh, for regular cooking, I like one that goes to 220 because they have some that go to 400 or 500 degrees, but then the, the, the gradations are so small that it's hard to pinpoint. 220 for cooking steaks and stuff, I think is really good. Or you could get a digital thermometer. And I have one of those too. I think I've shown them before. And they work great too. They require batteries. Um, they don't need to be calibrated. This one needs to be calibrated every so often. But so it's, it's, it's digital versus, I don't know what you call a non-digital analog maybe, but, um, but I do think Taylor's a good brand. And I think I could be wrong, but they're like, I don't know, 10 bucks or something like that. And in my opinion, 10 bucks is a small price to pay for the accuracy that you're gonna get in cooking, especially if you're just starting out. So here's uh, the salad. And we'll put a little bit of pepper on there because I like pepper and I like that garnish. But it's a real quick salad. I'll put that over here. And now, while our steak is resting, we're gonna get into the fun thing, the fun part. Um, Actually, you know what? I'm gonna ask Ken. Can can you go and ask Cheryl or Cheryl Ken or Trisha? Can you ask Sharon for the the glass pitcher so that I can make the sangria? Okay, we're gonna make sangria, and sangria is a really interesting. It's a it's a. I guess you could call it a cocktail because it's a, it's a mixture of wine, cognac or brandy, um, a, a liqueur which is a uh, triple sec or a cointreau. And then mixers, right? Which is fruit and juice, and it's really delicious. It's great for hot weather. Um, it's just really nice when you're at the beach. It's really great if you're at the pool, and it's a crowd pleaser. So if you are, you like spirit forward drinks, you'll enjoy this. If you're just starting to explore the the cocktail genre or, you know, spirited drinks, I think this is it's a really easy drink. It's really breezy, perfect I think for Labor Day. So. Um, I'm using here Covassier, which is very good cognac, by the way. Cognac is brandy from the cognac region of France. I, for my, for the, I'm using Cointreau here, and triple sec Cointreau and Gramonier are all 
orange liqueurs. Okay, so that's what you're looking for is an orange liqueur. And here I'm going to be using, um, thank you, a Cote de Rhone. And what the reason I picked this one is, um, it comes from a, a kind of warm, hot Mediterranean client region of France, that, and we have this available in our stores now. Sangria is Spanish, right? It originated in Spain. And the, 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 the technical wine that is used to make a true sangria is um, Rioja. From the, it's, Rioja is the name of the region, and it's, the wine is called Rioja. And the grape, one of the grapes that they use in it is gar, Garnacha. And one of the grapes that is used in a, in a Rhone red wine is Grenache. And so Grenache and Grenache are technically, it's the same grape, but one's French and one is Spanish. Um, and so I thought it would be nice, a nice connection to use this wine. The other reason why I wanted to use this wine, shameless plug, is that this wine is currently being featured um, in our wine finds section in all of our stores. And so the reason I wanted to talk about wine finds is we have a selection of wines that we change out every couple, every three or four weeks. And Marvin Chang, who is our uh, advanced sommelier with the quartermaster sommeliers, picks the wine. And I told him that he needs to pick wines that are 10 to $13 a bottle, but drink like they're $20 or more. And I think he really delivers, he over delivers on that promise. And so, you know, if you've not tried one of our wine finds wines, you should try them because you can buy a $10 wine. You, it's easy to find a $10 wine, but it's hard to find a $10 wine that what I would, is what I would consider true to type, which means it, it, it reflects the region or the wine style that it's supposed to be from. So totally worth trying, pick any of the wines. And if you don't like them, bring it back to the store. I'll give you your money back. And tell, tell, just tell them Keone said, no problems. Anyway, so we're gonna go into, we're, we're gonna get this thing going. We're gonna put some fruit into, the, into this thing. So I'll prep that now. And this is an Envy Apple that we're gonna do. And Envy Apple is one of those cool happening apples that people love these days. Really, really interesting flavor. I'm going to slice it up. I'm going to cut it in half. So we get that set. I have orange here. Now you, I'm going to slice it and the part, I'm, I'm going to use, use the, the whole skin on and everything because the pith I think gives a nice complement of light bitterness to this, to the, to the cocktail, but also the skin has that, you know, the essential oils from the zest, which I think will also help make, will make the drink very delicious. And I have my pitcher. I'm going to go ahead and throw that inside here. Throw the apples inside. I've got my lemon. I'm going to put some in here. The cool thing about this too is I did list, I listed different things you want to put, you can put into your sangria, but you know, you can get creative with the different fruits that you have available. But citrus is an important component to making a good sangria, okay? That's gonna go inside there. Uh, what else do I have? Lime is gonna go inside. I'll take the stem off. Can you put star fruit? That's a really good question. Let's see what happens here. Give me, that's like spoiler alert. It's like, for, what do you call it? Foreshadowing or what do you call it in a movie? Um, that's gonna go inside there. I got strawberries. I, one thing about strawberries, what I like to do is to the container, you know, as you notice, it has holes, right? So when I, I'll open the container, I'll wash it. I'm sure you guys all do that too. You just wash it, let it drain out so that I can use the container and I'll cut the stems off. Betty wants to know if the smashed cucumber is your creation. I wish it was. I saw it. Um, I was in a restaurant called Gramercy Tavern in New York uh, last summer, and they did a version of that, and I thought it was really cool. Then I started to research it, and um, it, and it, I learned that it was a thing. So, um, yeah. Our fruit. From my tree, right over there, see that? Okay, we're gonna slice some of these up. Of 
point for the other side. I think I have some uh, raspberries we'll throw inside too. I'm gonna throw some in now because they'll get all squashed up, but then I'll use them for garnish later. So already this thing is looking delicious, right? Like really, really nice. Okay. Now we're gonna add some sugar. A couple of things like um, I'm adding this. I'm, I threw this all in because I wanted you to see it. I'm gonna throw the sugar on top. Keep in mind that if you're doing it at home, maybe you want to put the sugar in first next time because it can start to dissolve. Then we're gonna add some of the Grand Marnier, a third cup. That's the third cup, exactly. We're gonna add a cup of brandy. That is a perfect cup of brandy right there. We're gonna add some uh, orange juice, a cup of orange juice. And I'm using no pulp version. Cup of that. And then we're gonna add the red wine. And here's the thing too, I meant to tell you is, the, you may, I was waiting for someone to say, is like, does it matter like on the wine, right? And so here's the thing that I would recommend. And even for cooking, if you're cooking with wine, if you're gonna make sangria, you need to work with a wine that you would be happy to drink as is. If you're buying a wine and you're like, ooh, and you think that I'm gonna make this taste I'm gonna cover the flavor up. I mean, you're okay, but you're never, it's not gonna be that good. And so you should commit if you're gonna, when you're gonna make a sangria, if you're gonna cook with wine, to find a wine that tastes good that you would happily drink. And if you're not gonna happily drink and it's too harsh, don't cook with it, don't make sangria with it. You'll be, you'll be glad you did that way, okay? Do so you we're need gonna to use red wine? Great, Great question. question. You do not. There are white sangria, there's rosé sangria. I chose to make a red sangria because I think that's probably the one that most people think of when they think of sangria. But you do not need to use uh, red wine. And to that point, I think the ratio, the ratio I would say for making sangria in general is lots of fruit, a bottle of wine, a cup of juice, a little brandy, a little bit of Cointreau, or some other, you can also experiment, there's other, Liqueurs out there, Cointreau is the orange flavor, right? There's, uh, I'm trying to think, I'm blanking now, but there is, uh, I, I think I'm gonna let you know, but use, you can experiment with different fruits, different flavors, different wines, but use the same relative ratio. And then you can have a lot of, you know, interesting things. I think Canton is a, like a ginger liqueur that could be interesting. So there are different things that you can play with to try to get different experiences. Now this here would be great if you let it sit overnight so that all the flavors can macerate, right? And then when you make the drink, what you wanna do is use some of the fruit, get back in there, use some of the fruit that's macerated as part of the garnish in the drink, okay? So we're going to let this speed macerate and pretend that we're letting it macerate overnight. And then I'm gonna start to bring this all together now We've had a lot of fun and we've done some really fun dishes, but one of the things I realized is that a lot of the dishes that we make um, have rice or they have mashed potato, what, like starches in there. And I thought, hey, you know what? It might be nice to make a little bit of a lighter final dish for, for you all to see. But if you wanted to do like steak with rice or steak with potatoes and then the salad, totally fine. But I thought I'd just throw something out there for your consideration to think about um, for Labor Day weekend. So we have, of course, we have our salad here. We've got our sangria. And I thought, hey, you know what it would be fun? Let's make a salad. Let's do a steak salad. So we'll do one right now real quick. And for starters, I wanted to put, we're gonna start with some watercress, because steak and watercress, the peppery bitterness of watercress, I think is really delicious. And we're using um, hydroponic uh, watercress from, from Maui. And I, I, this top batch that I'm gonna put in here, I already washed, okay? But you, as you can see, when you buy this from the store, you can actually see the little, the, it comes with the roots, but you can see how it grows. You wanna, you cut the roots off, wash it, 
and then you can go ahead and use it. Perfect for, like I said, salads, sauteing, putting them in soups, okay? So, I also have, um, um, sorry. Oh, some people are asking if you can use amaretto or limoncello. You can use an amaretto, that would be interesting. Um, that's kind of a nice almond flavor. Um, limoncello would be interesting, but the thing about, well, like in limoncello is interesting because it's vodka or a neutral grain spirit with sugar and lemon, um, lemon zest. So I think, or lemon, it's macerated in lemon zest. So um, that could be really interesting. Um, you might have to experiment with that because that depends how strong it is, but limoncello I think could be really interesting. I'm trying to think of the other ones that I wanted to tell you guys about. Mm. I can't remember, but that, that could work. Limoncello could work. Midori. Interesting. For those of you that uh, maybe frequented um, a place called The Wave in Waikiki, it makes me think of a thing called The Green Monster. Um, but yeah, melon could be interesting. And any of those fruit, any of those fruit um, liqueurs I think could work. I'm bored, interesting. Yeah, I like Drambouille. it. Drambouille. Drambouille, I'm trying to think, remember what the what the character, is it a Drambouille or is it more of a, okay everyone, this is where everyone starts to speed typing. Is Drambouille, is, you're not even like hammering me. Uh, Drambouille, is Drambouille's not raspberry. Fra Framboise is raspberry. Drambouille I feel like is a, um, it's not a, it's more of a, um, Is it? Not. Nah. It's an herbal. I feel like Drambouille in my head is herbal. So I don't know if that would work. You want a fruit liqueur. Okay, so I got some, so these are like nice tender um, butter lettuce. We got a nice kind of peppery watercress. I'm gonna take a piece of uh, our steak here that's ne rested nicely and it's actually room temperature, which also I think is great. Um, um, because it's good for the salad, right? Now, I'm one of the things I want to show you is to to have well, I have it so you don't have to pound the steak. I cooked it to like a medium, medium, medium where it's done this, and you can see all the lines going this way, right? So I'm gonna cut it against the grain. I'm also gonna cut it at a bias. All of these things that I'm gonna do will help make sure help ensure a. a a delicious tender eating experience, okay? So, see, I told you, herbal. You can try it, go for it. Gramonier, perfect. Gramonier is orange. So like Gramonier, triple sec, um, and uh, Cointreau are all orange liqueurs. We should work great. So I see the dunnest I'm looking, this is the dunnest I'm looking for. It's nice medium or medium, and I'm slicing it at a, against the grain. Okay. And I'm not doing a really good job of slicing it, but you get the picture. So I'll take this and we'll put it on top. Okay. And then the cool part is, okay, well, where am I gonna go with this? Well, let's see, we'll, we'll put some, I have some chickpeas, AKA garbanzo, right? Um, I have some camuela tomatoes that we have here that I picked up. So funny, I, I gotta have the container here because I want you to see this is local, right? Big Island. And I, and I love Whole Farms, but I figured, you know, I gotta, gotta share the love. So we're gonna do camuela tomatoes today. Before you do that, can you show us again how to cut against the grain? Because it can be Absolutely. confusing. Absolutely. One thing I do with tomatoes sometimes is I buy them, right? Well, I do them a lot, actually. I buy them even though they look ripe. I leave them on my my counter until they're like kind of almost, you, you might say like they're starting to be a little bit too soft, but I'm trying to get more flavor out of them. And so that's one thing you might want to think about trying to experiment with. I got some green onions. I will just take some quickly, throw them inside here. 
Uh, I have a, a pepper, yellow orange pepper. Take a little bit of that. And I'm trying to figure out where I want to go with this. The thing that I'm thinking about, as I, what I'm thinking about when I'm making this, I don't want the pieces to be too big because it's hard to eat, right? Put some of that on here. And I'm and when I'm thinking when I'm when I thought about what I was gonna make this salad with, I'm trying to think of flavors, textures, and colors, right? So I picked an orange one because I already have a red tomato on here. I got all this green stuff. So I didn't want to have the repetitive colors that we're doing. Okay, I got avocado. And by the way, on these avocados, this is a Haas avocado. What you're looking for when you're picking on avocados, you want to hold the avocado. Typically the Haas will be kind of black like this, right? When you buy them, they might green, they start to turn black. And you want to feel it. When it starts to have give, that's kind of an indication that it's ready to go. If it's really soft, went too far, if it's starting to have this nice kind of give here, that tells you that you're probably in good shape. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens when I cut this thing open. Do you think that uh, different that. colored peppers have different tastes? And why is there price difference between all the different colors sometimes? Really good question. And I think when I tell you what I think, it's I think it all makes it all makes sense. Um, by the way, I scored it. Did you notice I, I scored it in the skin? And then we're going to scoop it out. I'll put it over here. And now, what I, I noticed I did not dress this. And so what I would typically do, you could dress the, the greens and put it together, or you could do it like it was considered dry. And then I would serve dressing on the side um, or you could do something like what I would do here. You could put a citrus here so people can squeeze citrus and then they can put their own olive oils and I would serve salt and pepper on the side and people can then control how they want to season um, their salad. So the question was, how do I, oh yeah, okay. So the green peppers are always the cheapest, right? And the reason why they're the cheapest is because they're technically not ripe which means they've spent the least amount of time on the plant. So the, when the varieties turn to yellow, orange, and red, you've let the pepper completely ripen. And so what the, the reason why they're more expensive is because you're paying for the additional amount of time that it takes the, plant, the pepper to be on the plant to mature and ripen. And so essentially that's why they're more expensive, um, but you're also getting a different flavor, right? So the green ones are gonna taste, they're mild, but they taste kind of, I mean, for lack of a better term, they taste green. And when I say that, they, they taste more, they have a more of a chlorophyll, jalapeno-esque flavor. When you eat a red pepper or orange pepper, or yellow pepper, they're sweeter, and right? And so what you're doing is you're paying more because you've let it ripen on the plant and all of that, the, the plant has turned, converted a lot of things, a lot of the, I don't know what you call it, the inside, the maturity of it has, has created sugar. And technically, right, the plant, what, what, a, what it's doing is the seed, the, it's ripening because it wants to develop sugar. So ultimately it will fall off the plant and rot in the soil and fertilize the seeds so that they grow, right? And that's kind of like the whole process of, I guess we're talking about the circle of life, but that is why, um, that's what the plant's purpose is, is trying to get all the sugar development so that when it goes in the ground, it is fertilizing the seeds so they can propagate and grow more plants. But the time from green to fully ripened is why it costs more because you have to water them more, fertilize them more, take care of them longer, et cetera. That's, that's the reason. Okay, so question was going back to slicing, right? Okay, so we'll go back here. By the way, I need, to, I need to do a quality check. Hmm, good. Okay, so the lines are going this way, right? Now, if you look at the piece of the cut, you can see the fibers already, right? And what you're trying to do is you're cutting against the grain and you're kind of cut, cut thin. I have to start it again because I did a junk job the first time.
But then you're cutting sashimi. But I'm cutting it, I'm trying to cut it thin so that when you eat it, this lean piece is not tough. So that's kind of what we're doing there. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have our sangria, we've got our salad. And if you wanted to, I'll show you real quick. You could also make the salad, right? And you could use that as part of the garnish. For the dish here. And like, this is a killer. Just like I'm, like I'm, even me, like I, I love meat, I like my starch. But if I was served this, I'd be happy. So here's our salad. Put that down there, we can look at that. Again, here's our uh, cucumber, our smashed cucumber. And I'll just really quickly, I'll do a quick, uh, I'll do a quick garnishing. Now, because that the drink here has not sort of cooled down, right? This is still marinating. And if you're making this on the fly, you like your friends just showed up, you, so you, you got your ad hoc party going on. What I would do is I'd, I would put some ice in here because I want it to be cold. And it's gonna give a little bit of dilution, so it's gonna be a little bit refreshing. But then what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take some of the fruit here. Okay. We got some, some of the citrus, we got some berries, we got some apples. Get that they get all in there. It's got the raspberries we talked about. And then, you know, I would say that you're creating an Instagrammable moment too. Um, then here's, so here's our ice, here's our garnish, right? Take some of this, pour it on top. And then you can serve it to your guests. Now, they're gonna have to work around the fruit, but usually what people do is they'll start eating the fruit and drinking it at the same time. So here we have it. Um, are there any last minute questions that I actually forgot to ask if there are any more, but we're kind of done here. Chassie, can you zoom in on the wine again? The wine bottle or? The wine bottle. Where'd it go? Oh, here it is. Here we go. So we'll put it, I'll put this down here. I'll put the picture. I'm trying to figure out how to make this look cool. Pineapple's awesome. You know, I think it would be cool if I were to think about pineapple, I would maybe do a white sangria, you know, and I would use, be interesting to do something like with Sauvignon Blanc from Napa Valley because when you think of the characteristics of Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc, tropical fruits is one of those things that you think of. Might be really interesting to do that with like a, a Gewurztraminer too, like from uh, Washington State because that also has tropical notes in there, but that's a really great idea. Lychee, pineapple, that's starting to sound really good. Dragon fruit might be really cool too, but uh, here we have our, you know, our killer Labor Day weekend get together. And, you know, this is the uh, on the lighter side version. Um, if you want to like go for it, do some baked potatoes, you know, do that steak, do some mushrooms, do the salad, make the sangria, blow all your friends away, have a good time. Well, I know you, if you're on Oahu, you're quarantining. So just you and your family. If you're not on Oahu, blow your friends away. Um, with that, hope you guys had fun. We'll see you next week. I still don't know what we're gonna do, but I promise we'll send it out soon and it will still be fun. We'll have a good time and uh, send us your pictures. We'll see you next time.